Hello everyone. I am Nikos Kavalis. I'm one of the managing directors of Metals Focus, the Precious Metals Research Consultancy. Thank you all for taking the time to watch this video. And of course, many thanks go to One to One for continuing to organize these events and helping, um, helping us stay in touch with the mining community at a time when um, traveling and actually seeing people in person is still very, very difficult. Today, I will speak to you about the silver market and specifically look at um, metals focus forecasts over the next, uh, over the rest of the year and into 2022, as well as, you know, put some perspective and look at how the market behaved during um, 2020 and over the first few months of this year. If we start by looking at the silver price, we can see that although there has been some significant um, volatility and there have been some dramatic fluctuations, overall silver has managed to um, maintain a relatively high trading range, um, certainly compared to uh, where we were this time last year. As you can see in the chart, prices have managed to stay above the $24 um, dollar mark for pretty much the whole period. In terms of driving forces behind price fluctuations, I think investor activity has been um, certainly the most important driver, um, both institutional investor activity, as well as, of course, retail investor activity, um, which we will look at in more detail a little bit later in the presentation. Gold has, of course, been a very important driver of silver price fluctuations. And as you can see in this chart, um, the two have moved very closely over the last um, six months. Silver's strong correlation with gold, of course, is nothing new. Um, this is a feature, uh, an almost permanent feature of the two markets. And it is always interesting to also look at how the two perform relative to each other. So in other words, whether uh, silver outperforms gold or gold outperforms silver, uh, during their fluctuations. And to do this, we can look at the gold-silver ratio, namely the ratio of the gold price over the silver price. And we can see that this has stabilized in recent months in the high 60s. Indeed, since um, the start of February, the ratio has traded in a pretty narrow range between 65 and uh, just under 70. And of course, this is a dramatic improvement um, in favor of silver compared to the peak of the COVID crisis last year, when the ratio got to levels not far off 130. Um, I believe the peak was uh, 127. Silver's out, outperformance over the last 12 months or so um, has also brought the ratio back to um, the long-term averages, average levels. Um, as you can see what we've done in this chart, We've plotted the historical ratio versus the average from um, 1990 through to the present time. And as you can see, we're currently very close to those levels. This new status quo, this new, let's say, normal um, reverses a trend that we had seen um, in recent years, during which gold had gradually outperformed silver. Um, even before the um, crazy um, spike that we saw last year in the ratio, it had been trading upwards for quite a number of years. Investment demand has been crucial in supporting silver prices, both in absolute terms as well as relative to gold. And in this chart, we can see an illustration of institutional investment demand by looking at net money managers positions in silver comex futures and as we can see these have been relatively healthy uh, for most of the last 12 months uh, notwithstanding the last few weeks of uh, modest liquidations the outstanding remains above 200 million ounces uh, which is considerably higher than the levels it got to um, at the peak of the COVID crisis last year let alone the net short positions that we had seen for parts of 2019. Crucially, although healthy, net positions remain considerably lower than the all-time peaks that they had reached um, in the past, which um, 
in metals focus view suggests that there is uh, further scope for um, continued inflows into um, silver from professional investors. Inflows have also continued into ETFs or ETPs. These are uh, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, the let's say the majority of positioning we believe is held by uh, retail investors, although there is a considerable institutional investor element in ETFs, ETPs um, as well. Behind the strength of investment demand um, for silver has been, of course, the wider supportive macroeconomic backdrop, namely the continued loose monetary policy environment, um, negative real interest rates abounding, um, the continued fiscal uh, injections into the economy creating inflationary pressures and inflationary risks going forward, um, as well as the wider concerns about the um, you know, safe haven appetite on the back of wider concerns about the future of uh, various economies uh, considering the virus crisis has still not fully abated in spite of much of the Western world now having pretty high vaccination rates. I would now like to turn my attention to the silver market's fundamentals, uh, the supply demand conditions, and have a look at what happened in 2020 and see where we are at the moment and where we're likely to go over the rest of the year. First, I would like to start with uh, uh, mine production. And as we can see from this chart, um, a number of the major silver producing countries suffered significant losses last year. And this resulted in global mine production for silver falling by around 6% overall. This was equivalent to nearly 50 million ounces of losses last year. If we look at um, the individual countries in a little more detail, um, we saw the biggest declines uh, being suffered by Mexico. Um, and Mexico is the, uh, the world's largest producer of silver. Um, although we also saw declines in Peru, um, China, Chile, and as you can see, a number of other countries, all of which culminated in the, the overall loss that we saw in the previous chart slide. And if we look at um, mine production in even more detail um, and trying to have a look at month-by-month um, -month performance, we can see that most of the losses suffered last year were centered in um, in the months of April and May, um, to a lesser extent March in, in, in some cases. Uh, as you can see, very soon after, um, a pretty healthy recovery um, began, and by the end of the year, pretty much every major producing nation was back to normal levels. Dissecting um, the mine production decline into its individual components, namely primary and uh, byproduct output, uh, we saw declines across the board. Uh, primary supply fell, uh, but we also saw losses in zinc, lead, and gold production, um, whereas copper production was pretty flat year on year. In terms of um, relative importance, um, lead zinc mines continue to be the biggest source of silver production in 2020. In spite of the challenges that silver producers faced last year um, due to COVID-related disruptions, overall, it was a very good year to be a silver miner. As you can see from the left-hand chart, chart um, primary silver uh, oil in sustaining costs declined last year as a result mainly of uh, higher gold byproduct credits. And turning our attention to the right-hand side chart, uh, we can see that virtually the whole industry was uh, profitable on a cash cost basis and uh, the overwhelming majority of producers, of uh, primary producers, were also um, in the black on an oil in sustaining cost basis. And in fact, most of them enjoyed uh, very healthy margins last year. 
Overall, uh, primary silver reserves increased by around 7% last year um, as additions to reserves overall uh, exceeded mining depletion. Um, and looking at corporate activity or M&A activity, um, we, um, our analysis suggests that the value of completed um, M&As in the industry was pretty flat at around uh, just under 40 million US dollars. We also saw an increase in the overall hedge book of silver producers last year. Um, and as you can see from the chart, options remain the favorite among them. And the other thing that's worth noting is that the amount of silver production covered by streaming and royalties increased by um, uh, 1% last year. Looking at 2021, Understandably, Metals Focus expects a very dramatic rebound in mine production. And, you know, if we remember a few slides ago, we saw that already by late 2020, um, production rates had returned to normal levels. And major producers' guidance is that um, they expect to operate at full capacity throughout this year, whether this is because of uh, rising vaccination rates, um, or processes in place to mitigate um, the impact of any uh, infections uh, and um, avoid, uh, avoid disruptions. Naturally, the biggest increases that um, we see are uh, happening in uh, countries where, um, uh, demand, where supply was hit hard last year. For example, uh, Mexico or um, a handful of uh, South American producers, Central and South American producers. Um, and it is also worthwhile noting that um, Mexico is expected to have a particularly ro robust year, uh, robust growth this year, as a result of um, a handful of new projects ramping up output. Um, and in fact, if we look at the overall picture, um, we see the recovery or the increase of uh, 2021 production uh, more than offset the declines that we saw last year. So uh, we're getting to a level higher than uh, back in 2019. Fluctuations in mine production over 2020 and 2021 dominated and are expected to continue to dominate uh, moves in overall uh, global supply for silver. Um, as you can see, uh, last year's decline um, which was slightly offset by an increase, uh, price-related increase in scrap, um, accounted for the bulk of the losses, um, uh, the 42 million ounce losses that we saw in global supply. And moving to 2021, the 64 million ounce increase in mine production is uh, accounts for the bulk of the uh, recovery or increase in global supply. Turning to demand, industrial fabrication continues to account for the lion's share of the global total. Uh, over the last few years, it's been at over a little over 50%, and we expect this status quo will persist during 2021. In 2020, industrial demand suffered declines, uh, which was understandable and, uh, and expected uh, considering uh, COVID-19 related disruptions, as well as their impact, uh, the impact of the crisis on consumer sentiment. What was interesting was that uh, dec this decline was uh, really quite modest. Um, it was only, only 5% overall. Um, and this was due to uh, pretty healthy, pretty good support uh, from um, electronic applications, uh, which in turn, they account for the uh, bigger portion of uh, total industrial fabrication, and they and were only 4% lower last year. This um, fairly benign outcome uh, came as a result of uh, growth in photovoltaic applications as well as some support from consumer electronic sales being uh, reasonably healthy uh, due to um, support from people having to buy devices to work from home or um, to keep themselves uh, entertained as they were stuck at home for most of the year. For 2021, we expect an 8% increase in overall industrial fabrication uh, to a record high. This will uh, be driven by, uh, well, first of all, a recovery across all areas that suffered losses last year. 
continued growth in uh, photovoltaic applications, uh, as well as an additional boost by uh, usage of um, silver-bearing electronic components in cars, whether this is due to growing uh, penetration of uh, battery electric vehicles or because of uh, increased use of increased inclusion of um, driving automation or uh, driving experience uh, systems in cars. Silver demand for the production of powders and pastes used by the photovoltaic or solar industry increased last year by around 2% and is expected to increase again uh, in 2021 by 4%. And um, this was underpinned by uh, healthy growth in um, solar installations last year uh, when they exceeded 130 gigawatts for the first time ever. Um, and um, again, this trend is expected to continue uh, this year, which is why we see uh, ongoing growth in silver offtake. Another factor that has supported silver demand from this industry is the fact that, as you can see in the yellow line in this chart, the even though thrifting or uh, efforts to reduce the amount of silver used per cell um, continue, the extent of these declines are is really quite modest, has been really quite modest in recent years, particularly if we compare it to the losses that we suffered at the, the start of the previous decade. This reflects technical limitations um, that um, uh, R&D departments of uh, uh, solar, pro solar cell producers have been uh, facing, as well as efforts or the need to maintain high efficiency levels, uh, which require um, higher silver loadings, or at the very least, um, limit the extent to which these can be reduced. The picture is a lot less rosy when it comes to jewelry and silverware. Um, fabrication. Jewelry was down by more than a quarter last year. Um, this was mainly due to India, where a combination of uh, the pandemic's impact on incomes, um, movement restrictions, uh, as well as also notably higher silver prices, kept demand under extreme pressure. Um, however, steep losses were also seen um, everywhere else as well, uh, and this was amplified by destocking across the supply chain. Silverware did even worse. Um, it basically halved last year. Again, India was the main culprit. It was, which uh, demand there was around 60%, uh, nearly 60% lower. And all the factors mentioned under, uh, earlier for jewelry uh, played a part, as well as cancellations of social events in the country that resulted in lower gifting related demand. Both jewelry and silverware are expected to recover strongly in 2021. Uh, however, um, considering the higher price environment as well as COVID-19 still being an issue across a number of key consuming countries, uh, most notably India, uh, with uh, the recent terrible situation that we've seen in that country, um, this, in our view, means that it's very hard to see a return to pre-pandemic levels. One area of silver demand that actually benefited from the COVID-19 crisis was physical investment, namely the purchases of uh, silver bars and coins. Whether this was um, a reaction to uh, concerns about the impact of the um, uh, COVID-19 crisis on uh, global economy and the future of um, equity prices, or whether this was a reaction to or concerns towards the monetary and fiscal policy response of authorities around the world to the crisis. Safe haven demand by Western investors uh, increased con considerably um, for uh, silver bars and coins. This resulted in um, demand overall in 2020 rising by 8% to a four-year high. And crucially, this increase came in spite of an 85% decline in Indian investment, which is uh, which was a very important headwind or a very significant headwind for um, the overall market, considering India has traditionally been one of the biggest bar markets around the world. In, in fact, for much of the previous decade, India was the biggest bar, um, uh, bar market in the world, silver bar market in the world. 
In fact, um, Western um, retail investor demand would have been even stronger had it not been for COVID-19 uh, related disruptions causing shortages of investment products, uh, particularly in the United States and uh, in Europe. Um, and focusing our attention specifically on these two uh, markets, um, demand there was up by nearly 70% and over 20% respectively last year. For 2021, we see an even more, um, uh, an even stronger uh, out outcome. We expect a 26% increase in overall retail investment demand. And uh, fueling this uh, result is a return to semi-normality in terms of volumes uh, in India, um, as well as another healthy gain in the United States. And if we try to put everything together and see uh, how the different components of demand um, affected the overall picture last year and um, how we expect they will do in 2021, we can see that uh, last year's moves were dominated by the more than 80 million ounce decline in jewelry and silverware uh, fabrication, um, compounded also by a more modest uh, decline in industrial demand um, and even more modest for photographic which were partly offset by the 15 million ounce or roughly 15 million ounce increase in physical investment. Overall, the market lost uh, roughly 100 million ounces of um, demand. This, way, this, however, we expect will be more than offset by the recovery in uh, global demand this year. Um, we expect this will rise to a six year peak, um, rising by 15%. Um, and this is the combination of um, uh, a, a synchronized increase across all segments of silver offtake, including physical investment, jewelry and silverware, as well as um, gains in industrial demand. Even photographic applications are expected to increase this year, um, uh, reversing uh, momentarily their long-term downtrend as a result of some recovery in uh, primarily medical x-ray applications. Overall, we see demand uh, exceeding, one million, uh, uh, exceeding 1 billion ounces in uh, 2021. And if we try to put to everything together, uh, the supply and demand element together, um, the silver market is expected to re remain in a surplus uh, in 2021, um, as it has been, after all, for uh, the past few years. However, this, this surplus is expected to be a fraction of the oversupply that we saw last year. Crucially, considering um, institutional investment demand is clearly, is, is clearly uh, still robust, we think that there will be more than enough appetite to absorb this excess demand, whether this is into um, ETFs, OTC positions, or COMEX positions by institutional investors. As a result, Metal's focus continues to be constructive or bullish towards uh, silver. Uh, we believe that the macroeconomic backdrop uh, continues to be supportive for precious metals in general. Um, we also expect gold prices will rally further later into the year. And as a result of all these uh, factors, we believe silver will uh, rise to as much as $32 an ounce um, before the end of the year. And that although the next uh, six to 12 months are likely to continue to have significant uh, price volatility, we do think that uh, silver will enjoy strong support during uh, periods of liquidations or downside. And as you can see from this chart, we cannot see prices uh, breaking lower than $24 an ounce, even uh, during periods of uh, profit taking or severe liquidations. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, once again, many thanks to One to One for uh, organizing this uh, virtual event and for inviting us to present. And I would like to welcome you to get in touch with us if you would like to find out more information about the various products and services we provide, or simply if you would like to add your name to our uh, general mailing list uh, so you can receive our uh, regular weekly uh, Precious Metals Weekly publication. Thank you and uh, look forward to seeing all of you on the road when um, conditions start to normalize uh, for business travel.